Welcome to Lunch and Learn. Today we're talking about Olive Earl, an artist, a naturalist who first came to Staten Island in 1934 when she was hired through the Works Progress Administration to create murals for the new Staten Island Zoo located at Barrett Park. Incidentally, when the city took over the property, the, the Staten Island Institute of Arts and Sciences was in charge of planning and created an organization called the Staten Island Zoological Society to curate the exhibits. Apparently, she liked what she saw and decided to move here, remaining for the rest of her life. Some of her illustrations of plants and animals support research posted in the Institute's proceedings and various museum publications. She generously gifted the museum a large body of work consisting of drawings, photographs, children's books, book layouts, and paintings. In the process of currently assessing a number of the collections that we have, we came across original layouts to many of her children's books, hundreds of wildlife studies, family photographs and paintings, Please keep in mind through this presentation, her love of the openness, fields and woods on Staten Island as it reflects her love of nature that was nurtured in her as a young child. While doing research on Olive Earl, I came across a recent post posted only about a month ago on Reddit, asking for information about a painting someone had found at a thrift store. In the responses, there was a reference to a 1954 Family Circle magazine article about the image. The article was about how to grow plants from food from the market and instructions were given, identifying each of the plants on the windowsill. A brief biography followed and I wanna start off by reading that. This is the painting that the person found or print that the person found at the thrift shop. And you can see there are birds, there are, I mean, you can recognize a cardinal, um, but what she did with the magazine article, she identified everything. It, in the article itself, it's listed all the backgrounds, the birds, the foliage is listed and identified. And here you see, like here's a sweet potato, um, a mango, an onion, she, uh, we've all, we've all probably done this, taken the tops and just planted them in. But this was in 1954. It was a December issue and they were selling these prints for a dollar with the coupon. <laughs> so here's her biography from here, natural born naturalist. Natural born naturalist, painter, writer, and naturalist, Olive Earl lives in Staten Island. New York City's least citified borough where houses have yards, streets have shade trees, and where woods, marshes, and open fields still abound. She's married to illustrator Harry Doherty and lives in a high ceilinged airy house with a garden. Part of a garden with a bird feeding station is shown as the background for her painting. In it are a few of the staying north for the winter birds. She identifies all the birds. Ms. Earl was born in England and grew up with eight brothers and sisters who turned the household, she says, into a living zoo. She was eight years old when she tore her first flower to pieces and made drawings of the parts. Since then, her interest in natural history has been unflagging and she puts into her drawings of animals, birds and plants, accuracy, as well as beauty. As an artist, she's mostly self-taught. She, oops, sorry, she's worked mostly in the field, making notes in California and around her home, working at the biological research station in Bermuda and did an aquarium in Florida. Her work has been exhibited in the American Museum of Natural History in New York and in museums in Brooklyn, Los Angeles. She painted murals for the Staten Island Zoo, has done illustrations for a scientific volume Color Changes in Fishes for the Junior Encyclopedia Britannica, the American Encyclopedia, the Book of Knowledge, and for various junior science books, and her text and pictures have appeared in Natural History and other magazines. 
the first, oops, sorry. The first book of which she was both author and illustrator was published in 1951, State Birds and Flowers. She has since done other junior nature books for the same publisher and is completing a book about a family of swans to be published in this, this spring. She also wrote and illustrated Plants and Animals of Staten Island for Staten Island Institute of Arts and Sciences, of which she was made an honorary life member. Among her photographs, that was the slide I was looking for, State Bird, these, this was her first, State Birds and Flowers was her first published book. They were waiting on swans of Willow Pond. And we'll talk about Plants and Animals of Staten Island later on. Here, among her photographs were images of an estate labeled as Frank's Hall, which came up during a random search on historic England. Frank's Hall Park and Garden in Horton Kirby had been bought by her father in 1883. And he added a picture gallery to the house to house his collection of paintings. It was about 22 miles from London. So Olive, born in 1888, was born and raised in the middle of a hundred acres composed of woodlands, meadows, a river, ponds, and formal mid-Victorian gardens until it was sold in 1911 when her father moved the family to New York in response to World War I. As noted before, she had eight brothers and sisters, and in her own words, the household was a living zoo. This is a family photograph on the grounds. This book. And here's a map, it's about a hundred acres. It's a map of her property. And you can see how this is the entrance hall with a dog, of course. Um, and here it's one of the collages that she put together in her photo album. She, um, this was, it's an overall of the house and estate, which was originally built in, tw in 1220 by a Frankish family. And you've got some of the interiors here. So you can see what kind of environment she was raised in. This is also, it shows a bit of the diversity and scope of the property, um, formal gardens, pond, you know, just looks idyllic. Here we have one of her album pages where she's identifying animals, pets, and she's got others with horses and plants. And it's just, I guess, the beginning of her organizational skills in labeling any kind of scientific um, examinations that she did. And here they made a lot of group excursions into the wilderness. This is the island of Sark, 1907, as part of the Channel Islands. And there are a great number of of photographs showing the family out and about and climbing and digging up plants and just really being involved in the wilderness. In 1911, the family immigrated to New York City and Olive made this her home for the remainder of her life. Here's a brief overview. She was born in 1888, uh, immigrated from England to New York City in 1911 she lived in Manhattan, possibly in Greenwich Village until 1934. She was married to an Englishman, Sidney Hannon, in 1920, who died in 1925. She was remarried in 1933 to Harry Doherty, an illustrator. I believe he passed sometime in the 1960s, and she died in 1982 at the age of 93. I'm going to read some publicity and reviews for the next few slides. Um, we found these photographs in the collection and wherever we had some publicity, we included it. So, he, and all of these show that she is at heart a maker, constantly making things and experimenting and completely absorbed in nature. This is, I don't know where this article was from, um, but it says that it's sometime, this, these photographs were taken sometime in the early 1900s. She knows what children love, ragtime animals. Miss Olive Earl, a New York artist, has originated, originated the idea 
of making birds and animals out of towels and has advised children to do the same for it is a simple process. So don't blame the laundryman if your bath towels are missing, the children may have them. One good sized towel will make quite a flock of waddling ducks and wobbly lambs. Miss Earl believes it's better to cut from memory as the outlines are easily remembered and are the most important detail. If they aren't precisely photographic as to curves, so much the better, for they must reflect the imagination of the child and have enough humor so that they will be pleasant companions to have around. Any child coming home from the zoo or circus or farm, according to Miss Earl, is fully, fully capable of cutting out a toy animal and, or bird, and when realized that it has been made by themselves, it will be a most welcome companion. And here, moving on to 1921 in Miami, there's a Miami Herald two-part article, about a month apart. Batik from Java on Showit Beach. One of the most interesting of all sites over at Miami Beach is offered by Olive Earl of Greenwich Village, which she brought to the beach for exhibition so that the tourist will have a chance to see some beautiful examples of batik. And it can be accomplished by anyone with the aid of the book, which Miss Earl, in collaboration with Pieta Mijer, wrote on batiks and how to make them. So she was self-promoting quite a bit as well. And again, in 1921, still down in Miami, Miss Earl moves her studio to the Breakers. Miss Earl, who for several months has been exhibiting works of art executed by her and her friends at Oceanside Inn, has moved her studio to more commodious quarters at the Breakers. At the inn, her limited space prohibited her from working on large canvases, which she had, has orders to fulfill. At the present time, Miss Earl is at work on a commission for the aquarium where she's busy painting the various species of fishes at this institution after completing, and after completing this commission, Miss Earl will start work on large canvases. And I, I had assumed these, there's no dates on these paintings. I just thought it was a good place to fit them and they're really interesting. Now in 19, this is 1921, in 1928, the Times Union Brooklyn reported, artists and their art undersea life on canvas. 25 pictures by Olive Earl of New York and Bermuda, including watercolors and oils, illustrating the use of undersea life as motifs and decoration will be one of the features of the summer exhibition to be opened Memorial Day at the Brooklyn Museum. Undersea life has never suffered from over portrayal. Miss Earl is one of the few artists who specializes in this work. Her paintings are based on scientific study and observation. Miss Earl believes that to sketch fish, it is necessary to see them alive. While in Bermuda, she has used her glass bottom boat to trap her specimens and to study sea gardens. I have to go into this study rather thoroughly because fish forms, when used for artistic purpose, have so often been handled fancifully rather than truthfully. The most creative artists in the world cannot improve upon mother nature in this realm. Even the ancient Greeks in selecting the dolphin as the sacred symbol of Apollo have given us a creature that would not be recognized by its own mother. The Japanese the Japanese and Chinese deal more truthfully with these animals and their wonderful drawings are a source of perpetual inspiration. The Scandinavian artists too have appreciated fish forms in their pottery, in their pottery decoration using conventionalized motifs as handles to jars and finely colored rep reproductions in the ornamentation of vases. Fish in the natural realm are such marvels of line, grace, and color that we can use them to the best advantage as subject material only by painting them accurately. I think these are fabulous. Apparently she was doing some commissions on um, 
interiors. And these were painted by hand. I would love to do a little bit more research and find out more about these. Oh, and one more thing, Montclair Times in 1932, so it's getting closer to the zoo time when she was exposed to Staten Island. And painter of undersea life addresses teachers. The charm of Bermuda was the topic on which Miss Olive Earle, English painter of undersea life spoke. Miss Earle is a member of the Bermuda Corporation for Biological Research. She specializes in painting undersea life. In the course of her extensive study of highly colored tropical sea forms, she has made many observations underwater, frequently using a diving helmet for this purpose. And here we have her contract or purchase order for the murals at the Staten Island Zoo. The Staten Island Zoo, also known as the Barrett Park Zoo, was built by the New York City Department, Parks Department, 1934 through 1936, with some combination of federally funded labor or funds. The designer was the Parks Department Chief Architect, Imor Amor Embury II is shown by the Public Design Commission of the City of New York document. And the zoo's murals were created by WPA art project artist, Olive Earl. She was commissioned to complete murals as background in four cages. These were the reptile cages at the zoo. And I've included a number of these. I, I remember seeing these. I mean, I don't know if they're still there. It'd be great to get feedback at the end. And I'm sure there might be some people out there who might have some information on where she was living as well while she was on the island. Um, yeah, these are, I do remember these. And this is, these are just a variety of different views that came up. Um, they're pretty impressive. And there you go. And now we're going to talk about the Staten Island Institute's publication of Plants and Animals of Staten Island. Um, this is the pamphlet referenced by the magazine article published by the Staten Island Institute of Arts and Sciences. In 1953, Miss Earle wrote and illustrated a booklet about the plants and animals that lived on Staten Island. In her own words, I do that a lot, in her own words, she tells us what this book is about. Staten Island, a part of New York City, is different from the other boroughs. For one thing, you have to cross the bay on ferries to get to it. Remember, this is, in, this is before 1964 when the bridge was born. Um, except from New Jersey. And for another, it has less than 200,000 people, which make it the smallest borough in population. But the most important thing is that it isn't like a city at all. There are no skyscrapers, no subways, no section with block after block of buildings packed solid. <laughs> Instead, Staten Island is made up of a number of towns like Travis, New Dork, and Pleasant Plains. Most of them separated from each other by woods and fields. Even where they have grown together, especially on the North Shore, they have shady streets, big parks, and houses surrounded by gardens. This means that the people who live or visit Staten Island can do things that can't be done in some of the other boroughs. One of these is to enjoy the space, fresh air, and sunshine of open country. All this is wonderful for people, but it's even better for trees, flowers, and all sorts of animal life found almost everywhere on the island. However, as more people move in, the plants and animals move out because people's houses often take up the space where the wild plants and animals like to live. There are still lots of room though in Staten Island. And if we really want to, we can keep and enjoy a great, mem a great many of the areas where these wild things make their home. This little book gives pictures and interesting facts about a few of the plants and animals. There are a great many more, of course, but everybody who can recognize those in this book will know more than most people do, which will make a picnic, a hike, or an hour spent in your own backyards lots more fun. And here, this is the inside cover. Um, she, 
She drew out a map of the island. This is 1953, remember. Um, designated some of the um, wildlife areas. And as we move along, I've included, we have her original layouts for this. So these are actually drawings. I've included her original drawings and layout alongside the completed pages in the books. Here, the illustration for Pond and Stream show the cycle of a tadpole developing into a toad, a painted turtle sunning itself on a log, a water strider, and a whirligig beagle, beetle. Be beetle. <laughs> and on the facing page, let me turn my page, has a black duck, a uh, pie-billed grebe, white flowers of the water lily, and a cardinal flower. And here, you know, her, her layouts and margins are beautifully done. And this is indicative of most of her publications. Some of the animals and plants mentioned in this book are gone from the island or in danger of becoming lost. Here at the end of her book, there's a warning and a guide to preserving what the island has. She warns the branches must not be broken. Please don't dig up plants or chop down saplings and do not dump rubbish in woodlands and brooks. Brush fires are a particular concern of hers and calls for all others to show, calls for all to show others how to protect defenseless nature against thoughtless human beings. And here's, I pulled one of the books just briefly. Um, one of her books is Praying Mantis, 19th, done in 1969. And this is, um, she's concerned with her color layout here. And you can see um, she's got all sorts of information here, um, I guess for the publisher, for the printer. And she really loved her Bende yellow. Um, she's got little swatches here. And this is how layout was done years ago before Photoshop. Uh, and what we've got, there are many different layers here. This is the down and dirty, really messy way that things were done years and years ago. Um, you've got, these are all overlays of one piece. So you can see the matted work indicates Bende yellow, which he indicated in the other one. and. Yeah, she, uh, she was pretty meticulous and did some beautiful work. And we have all of those in our collection. We have all the layouts to all these books. Um, and yeah, and we're just at the beginning of, there's so much here that we're working on and trying to make accessible for everybody. So stay tuned. And here we have all of the sources and my contact information is down at the bottom in case anybody has questions or, you know, we are a research facility and down the road we will, you know, calling and make an appointment to do research is part of what we do. So thank you for being here and I hope you learned something. <laughs> and any questions you have, if we don't get a chance today, get in touch with me through my email. Thank you so much, Audrey. And also I will email you everyone who came to this um, program. I'll email you the list of sources and Audrey's contact should you have any more um, questions or maybe you have an Olive Earl illustrated children's book in your attic. We don't know, um, but yeah, we'd love for you to keep in touch with us. Um, do, do we have any questions in the house? I mean, I will just say that it seems like she was a consummate uh, maker. Um, and also she had just this, it seemed that she had uh, the spirit of an educator. Like it was always important to impart content um, at every stage. And I really appreciated the, the sort of call for attention and preservation on Staten Island at the end of that book. Um, we have a question uh, from Mitchell. Um, welcome, Mitchell. Does anyone know where her house on Staten Island was or is? And is it I, still standing? I, 
I would need to confirm this. I do know that you lived for a while in May Seeley's house on Harvard Avenue. I think it's Harvard, New York. Um, the house is still there. Uh, I actually know Nat Seeley and he's the one that brought it to my attention that she, I, I was saying, oh my God, I'm working on, you know, I was working with Riley, getting together the galley information. I said, oh my God, there's so much Olive Oil stuff. And he goes, well, she lived. And I thought he said across the street, but it's been confirmed. He, she, she actually lived, I think, in the Celia's house. Um, and I will confirm that because I'm gonna contact, I, I have a couple of friends. I want to get memories, if anyone remembers. And I, I know that there are stories out there. So yeah, and again, for all of our collections, you know, we do have people who remember so much of the past and I absolutely welcome that. So yeah, it, again, I think it was up on Harvard, New York, in this beautiful, I mean, I don't know if you know the house, but there was so much land around it. This still is, I mean, as of right now. Wow. So, yeah, she had a love of nature. I, you know, I was just fascinated by her, the influence her environment had on her. And when I found that estate that she was, you know, living in from birth to, you know, I, I, it was just amazing and it made perfect sense. I love the idea that her whole family went out to explore and discover. Yeah, and that um, article, when they said in the article, you know, the house was like a living zoo, it made me think of the Durrells of Corfu, but you know. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna use this opportunity to segue into uh, mentioning that if you're interested in learning more about plants and animals on Staten Island, there are, a number of videos in our Earth Day How To Fest that is coming up. Uh, it will all be live on Thursday, April 22nd, so one week from today um, for on Earth Day. And the Earth Day How To Fest is a collection of videos that represents a citywide skill share. So they're like, I think there are about uh, 20 videos uh, representing 20 different skills. Some of them, I mean, I have to be honest, I watched one on foraging on Staten Island. And now I am recognizing these edible weeds everywhere. I haven't eaten them yet, but anyway. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there are a number of um, really fun and um, informative videos uh, relating to Earth Day and citizen science. So um, keep your eyes open for that. And we hope to see you at the next Lunch and Learn too. Thank you so much, Audrey. And have a great day, everyone. Bye.